Representative Scott Zabiggy back on Thursday for a legislative roundup. Hello, Scott. Good afternoon, everybody. Hey, there you go. You're getting big applause. You're looking good. Thank you very much. My uh, wife dressed me. Uh, well, I mean, that's that's the best way. That's the best okay. way to go. I'm going to move this light so we can actually see one another. Uh, we, we make great advances in the studio. Scott saw me lose my mind because my entire uh, television right. broadcasting unit just fell. And so Biggie, knowing that I was annoyed, do you want to tell everybody what you said to me while I was like... Bah, 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 bah. Well, you, you were trying to figure out where it was going to go on the post it sits on. And I said, just get a marker out next time and mark the top of it. You know where it goes. And I said, thanks, Scott. <laughs> I appreciate your help. Hey, be careful with the IRS, though, because you're assuming you're going to be on the air Monday. That's true. You know. So they come in. They, they make this big deal of hitting, hitting us up. I don't know if you listen, but they hit us up. They asked us if we wanted to interview the commissioner of the IRS who was going to be in town. Okay, sure. And, Bell, it's like 28 emails back and forth, and they have to come in and do the sweep of the building, which is ridiculous. Looking but for Dan Mandis. I mean, I, I, or Brian Wilson, I, uh, the money. I mean, they're looking for the money guys, right? Mm -hmm. And like, there's like three of them doing the sweep yesterday, and they do this whole sweep. They meet me briefly, and then today, this morning, they say, we're not doing the interview. <laughs> so you were the last person they met? Uh, I think that's I think that's accurate. Is that accurate, Bell? Was I was that the last one they met? I didn't put it in those terms, but I, you know he may be on to something. Mm. Inquiring minds would like to know. I think they talked to Heidi. Maybe I'll start asking you questions. Come on, let's do, go. Do you have anything to hide from the IRS? I do not. I'm an open book. It's a it's a tawdry book, especially in the beginning chapters. Yeah, because we're talking about porn today. Well, well, we are talking about porn today, but. Um, for a different reason. So, uh, no no IRS interview. But the uh, are, do you have any special plans for the Eclipse Monday? Uh, I'll be in session. Okay. so We'll be working. You'll be blinded. I'll be blinded. By the, <laughs> one way or the other. You're not going to have a break just to go outside and watch it? Oh, they, they will. We, you know that. While will. we are working for the people of Tennessee, we are dedicated. So, you are going to have a break then? Yes. I was going to go. I was, doing, I was planning on doing my show on the roof. <laughs> but now I am Brian Wilson, I think, is going out of state. He wants to get to the uh, totality zone so he can do it in the dark so he can do his show in the dark. But he's not doing his show on Monday. He's going to be on the road. So I'll be shifting over there. So that's the big announcement. OK. Uh, all right. Let's talk. Um, obviously, we need an update on education. I, I know uh, we're, we're at a point where I think everyone kind of has a grasp of what the goal here is. Uh, everyone has developed. All the citizens of the state of Tennessee that are informed, I think, are starting to develop their opinions about it. Mm -hmm. uh, where do you think most of this state are? Uh, where, where, by percentage, what would you say the state tells you with regard to the issue of the Freedom Scholarship Fund? Well, not to make my assistant very angry, but we've been tracking this, the pros and cons as they come into the office. Um, and it's leaning at about 65 to 70 percent in support. Okay. Um, and that's not nine, that's not scientific, but we just track the people that are calling in to say pro or con. I think once people understand that there's multiple bills out there and what the House's version does, I think people start to realize of yes, there are there are opportunities for school choice. There are um, uh, parameters that have put on the House bill to make sure that it's not abused. There's not a uh, fraud or waste. Uh, opportunity is created, then they, I think they see what we're trying to do for public education to get that transformation trans, transformed also so that we can start to unlock the, uh, uh, Matt, the senators that have been here and, and the representatives in 2010 when our educational system was not very good, and, and people know it, and it was a fact, and they put a lot of things in place to right the ship, right, stabilize the ship, let, let, let's get it headed in the right direction, and they did that. They accomplished that. We are about where we are. We've been there for about a decade. But now it's time to unshackle education in Tennessee and let's take it to the next level. And that's what we're trying to do. And I think the people of Tennessee are starting to understand what we're trying to do. And I think you're starting to see a um, a groundswell of support of people saying, let's get this done. Uh, at its most basic, the differences between the House and the Senate, and I took away something that you said to me several weeks ago, and I have characterized it in this way, and I hope I'm doing it justice, mm -hmm. that the House of Representatives looks at the Freedom Scholarship Fund as a part of some education reforms that they want to see happen this year in the General Assembly. That's correct. The Senate's looking at this as kind of more of a standalone, let's do the scholarship, uh, the Freedom Scholarship Fund, 
and we, and while some of these ideas that the House are bringing up with regard to education reform, we want to do those too, but we don't don't want to do them necessarily together. And that's where we are negotiating how much reform we can include in the scholarship package uh, and to get these bills together. That, that's correct. We as a House, it's our job as chairman. We have to sell the why behind what we're doing. Right? It's not the what; it's the why. And so we've, we have to talk to our Senate colleagues because unless they match, it doesn't happen. We have to talk to our Senate colleagues, and we're doing that right now. We've been doing it for the last two weeks, trying, trying to explain the why behind what we're doing for public education, the why what we're doing behind the, 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 uh, the school choice, and then trying to listen to hear what they have to say and then try to incorporate it into a bill that both sides can get behind and, and help us change education in Tennessee. How close are we? Uh, we Just are, give us a status report. Where I, we I think you know, I, I I was probably 50-50 a week and a half ago, 60-40. Uh, I think I'm at 70-30, 75-25 is going to pass. We're, we're, we're going to get an agreement. And you believe that will do without conference committee? Can you make that happen without having to go to conference? Well, I can't. Whatever comes out of finance will be agreed upon by the House and Senate. Mm-hmm. Now, somebody could put an amendment on the floor, and then we've got to figure out figure that out. But the intention is is that whatever comes out of finance committee, this is what's been agreed upon so that the members can look at the legislation and vote one time. Fair enough. Um, those concerns on the part of our conservative friends, I always like to bring this up mm-hmm. because we have new listeners every time we talk. Mm-hmm. And many of you have heard these uh, conversation points in the past, but I want to bring them back up. Um, you know, liberals are acting insane. I mean, let's be honest. Uh, they are, they, their claim, their central claim is that Scott Sapicki and the rest of the Republicans that want to do this for families in the state of Tennessee are doing this for the purpose of destroying public education. Mm-hmm. And that's, it's, it's sad that that's where they are because they could be, I think, valuable voices in the discussion if they chose to be and they choose not to be. So well, I kind of dismiss them. Well, well, you can be in the room or out of the room. If you choose to be, uh, I guess, obnoxious is the word, because none of that data is supported at any state. There, there are no public schools that are closing. There, there are, there's no funding that's being diverted from public schools because if you look at all the states that have – look at Wisconsin where I went to school. They've had, they've had school choice forever, mm-hmm. and their public education system is top ten in the country. And by the way, I would, I would, I would suggest, and you've said as much, that – the design of this scholarship is to create something of a more competitive environment to encourage the public education system to get better. Yes. The design is to get better public education results. That's correct. And, and when, when Wisconsin did this, the public education system looked inward at themselves with the help of their, of their General Assembly, crafted legislation to free them up to get more creative in education in public schools. And guess what? They vaulted from 30th to top 10. And the... The concern on the other side, the one that I do want to address, is this concern that it will give government an opportunity to further regulate private education. Yeah, that's not that's not true at all there, Matt. In the House version of the bill, we put parameters in place to keep a buffer between government and these private schools. Uh, third party vendor, we are being prescriptive on exactly what they can ask for from these from these uh, um private schools mm-hmm. in, in regards to just the student that is taking the scholarship so that we can track the academic success of those students as they go through their career. And then we also put uh, parameters in place to prevent the, the pop-ups like you saw in Arizona that just balloon the budget out of sight, that you have to be in existence for three years, you have to be accredited. We put caps on it. We've got income qualifications for it to help the, the most disadvantaged first. But then open it up to everybody in the state. Hey, let, let the ones that are trapped in these failing schools around within a mile of us sitting here in your studio, give them an opportunity to find a better outcome f- for their education. And if they can, great. But let's, let the, let's also fund the public schools. By the way, nobody's talking about this. In the House's version, we're increasing funding to public education $400 more million. The other question I get on that line, where's the money coming from then? If we're not taking from public ed, where's this $140 million or there? Yeah. I mean, I know so, it'll be a little more that's, than that. That's a great question. And so when you look at the budget, our, our, our treasurer says, okay, we're going to see X amount of growth in the state. And I think they budgeted close to 6% last year. Well, we didn't hit 6%, but I think we hit 2 
Mm-hmm. So there's more money coming in. And what the governor knew what he wanted to do was was with the school choice. He had that budgeted for it. Plus, we had another $240 million increase automatically in the governor's budget for p- public schools. We also found some extra money laying around that, that was not being allocated anything. That's recurring that we decided to say, hey, let's do some more things for public schools on helping for maintenance, helping rural schools, because here's the problem, Matt. If we don't do something for our rural districts, the bleed off from teachers moving to other other districts that can pay more continues to happen. So we've created a, a system that will be able to help those rural districts maintain their best teachers so that we can create more opportunities across the state for all teachers. Let's talk the politics of all of this. Sure. How many votes you got in the House right now, you think? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? You know. I, I'm worried about I'm worried about finance sub right now. So you're just taking it as it comes. One step at a time. You know, how do you eat an elephant, right? We're, we're, well, we're 1-0, and, and we're just going to continue to try to be 1-0 and, and win every committee we go through. But there are back-channel discussions between the House and the Senate ongoing. Is I, that fair? I, I believe that if you see a bill that both the Senate and the House agree upon that goes to the floor, it, it, not only will we have stuff for, for public schools, but we'll have that off-ramp for some for some to want to take advantage of school choice. Scott Zabiggy with us uh, for uh, about 15 or so more minutes. Let's talk some other issues involving Tennessee teachers. Tennessee teachers could be allowed, reading from the Tennessee Star here in Michael Patrick Leahy, could be allowed to carry firearms while on school property. The state Senate poised to vote on legislation allowing faculty and staff to carry concealed weapons if they are licensed, trained, and undergo a psychiatric evaluation. The Senate Judiciary Committee voted to advance the bill, 1325, which would authorize school faculty and or staff members to, quote, carry a concealed handgun on school grounds subject to certain conditions, including obtaining an enhanced handgun carry permit and completing annual training. Obviously, this is in the Senate. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it has. I mean, obviously, it has a companion somewhere in the House. Who's uh, where is it in the House? What do you know about the Senate bill and what are your thoughts on this? So, Ryan Williams, we passed this bill last session. Well, Well, it's on the House floor. Mm -hmm. So we held it because the Senate didn't move it last year. So we so you don't have to go through the committee process. No, We've already had it sitting on the House floor for over a year waiting to be voted on. There you go. And so um, a lot of those things you read off in there about the training and the Mm -hmm. mental evaluations, uh, those were things that we put on in the education committee to make sure that we have people that are properly trained uh, in the crisis situations that they'd be faced with. Uh, we put in there to make sure that that they uh, have to get approval from the sheriff or the head law enforcement agent and also from the director of schools to make sure that this is someone that is qualified to go in there and carry a firearm. Uh, we wanted to make sure that they had a mirror's reflection of what an SRO officer looks like so that we can make sure that that person is adequately trained in the event of a catastrophe to help stop it. Because we all know, and you can look at Covenant, and Metro Nashville did a fantastic job of how quickly they responded. But if there was someone in that building that had a firearm and knew how to use it and was trained, we could have limited the loss of life. Yeah, it's a a sad reality that the Covenant School, being a private school, Mm -hmm. uh, they they had an individual uh, who was on vacation, Mm -hmm. uh, and that person had been trained and, and had been mm-hmm. authorized to have a firearm in their possession on property, and they weren't there. I mean, it's sad mm-hmm. to say, but it is true. And if there, uh, were, and there were other people there? that But, was but had there been others, that's right. Uh, so here's the way I envision this happening in the real world. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that there are plenty in uh, of these types of individuals that I'm about to describe. We're talking about Second Amendment advocates who happen to be history teachers or you know, gym teachers coaches. or coaches or assistant principals, male, female, I don't care, mm-hmm. uh, but people that are already familiar with firearms, that are comfortable in their use and, and to keep and to carry, uh, that would jump at the opportunity to be that person, that point person within a system. So you're not talking about somebody that's afraid of guns, having to have a gun on their person. No one's being forced to do this. I think there are plenty of those instructors embedded in the school system right now that would jump at the chance to have that ultimate ability to protect their students. God forbid they have to. The, the key is there to protect their students. The, the most uh, uh, vulnerable population that we have that's out there that is susceptible to this is our student populations. And so, um, yes, I agree with you. I think these individuals are ones that, that will be eagerly to go through the training to go through the background checks, to go through the mental evaluations, to make sure that in a crisis situation they have the proper training and background to be able to respond appropriately to a crisis that erupts in a school. And it's going to happen again. 
we're going to have another crisis in a school. It's it's just where we are right now, unfortunately, in life. And we got to have people that respond. Uh, the reaction on the part of some of your friends to the left, typical. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you respond to some of their reaction? They they want, and, and we were talking about this a little before we came back on air. Um, they are playing psychological warfare when it comes to guns, mm-hmm. and, and they want to anthropomorphize guns in a certain way, and that guns are always evil. And anytime you introduce a gun in a situation, that's always a bad thing to do. And they've been insisting upon this to our small children for a long time now. Mm-hmm. Thankfully, we have good law-abiding citizens that believe in the Second Amendment and believe in the right to self-defense that teach differently. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they are just beside themselves at even the suggestion that you would introduce guns into the school setting. Now, you and I both know that SRO presence is already an introduction. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you respond to them, though? What do you say to them? Well, I'm really perplexed at their at their position because when we ran the SRO grant program for public and private schools, the state would pay for one SRO in every school across the state of Tennessee. It passed with bipartisan support. Mm-hmm. When we ran the school safety grant, which was for cameras and the, and the resistant film and, and better security measures to protect our children, bipartisan support. This part of the bill is another piece of the puzzle, Matt. There's no one magic bill to stop this, but it's putting layers of protection here. Getting teachers who volunteer to do this, who are properly trained, go through the backgrounds, go through the continuing ed uh, 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 certifications every year, right? Let's put another layer of protection there. Let's let's try to make sure that we have people that are there to respond in the event of a tragedy that can stop this quickly. If you can stop, if you could have stopped the shooter at Covenant at the door, we wouldn't have been talking about the loss of life. Twenty-two after the hour. Quick timeout. Many of you bringing some questions to the table through the Members Nutrition Super Text Line. I'm going to filter those questions through the Members Nutrition Super Text Line right directly to Scott Sapicki in just a moment. It's one twenty-two on Super Talk ninety-nine-seven WTN. Super Talk ninety-nine-seven WTN. So yesterday we learned of this. Um, I, I was unaware that this was legislation that was moving through the Senate and uh, and I suppose the House of Representatives as well. It was um, it was a pornography website bill that would require adult pornographic websites that are uh, in the state of Tennessee. That's the easiest way to say it. Uh, to verify the age of those viewing those websites in this state. It has now advanced in the Senate. Uh, it um, There was a brief change to it regarding cost of implementation or whatnot. Uh, the amended vis- uh, version of the bill um, has a physical note of somewhere in the neighborhood of a couple of million dollars a year. Uh, but this would create a dynamic by which parents believe that they would have uh, additional tools state provided uh, to prevent their children from viewing uh, pornographic websites. Scott Sapicki, what say you on this bill? So 73% of teens in a national survey responded that uh, ages 13 to 17 have watched pornography, 13 to 17. And 54% of those under the age of 13 said they, that's when they watched it was before the age of 13. It mm-hmm. is, pornography is a scourge on our society. Um, it destroys families. It destroys the emotional stability of a young child. Uh, it, it, it deteriorates their ability to have relationships with people because it sets unreal expectations on what relationships look like. And it's not a function of the real world. And so we, I can give you chapter and verse about how pornography destroys lives. I'm not even going to go there. We and, I, and I think, and, and I don't no, think we need to, no, because no. I think we agree, agree on, right. on all of those points. And, yeah. one, and one of the things we want to do is to be very careful of big government. Be very careful. How can we do this in a way that still puts the parents or the individual in charge, right? And so what we did was, you know, you have to verify your age to access these sites in Tennessee. And if you're over the age of 18, then you can do whatever you want. It's not a problem. If you're under the age, then no, you can't. And to prevent Matt Murphy, just as an example, to to prevent Matt Murphy from using his ID and then allowing a minor to get on there after you leave, you have to redo it every hour to make sure that it's Matt Murphy who's still on there. And so that's 
we, we tried to work through this. My gut feeling is you'll probably see some some legislation after the Homeland Security of Tennessee gets a hold of this, and you know they start to look at the what do you call it the uh, application and practicality of the law. I would be willing to bet you we'll probably have a cleanup bill next year to probably look at the process. You know, I uh, my uh, my default position is to default to is this the government's job, mm-hmm. and is government doing something that others could be doing better or that is the responsibility or role of other people in this case it would be the parents right. and that and I get stuck I'm stuck on that right now so look, when I was I'm 57 years old right when we grew up I don't know how old you are how old are you man? I'm 50 50 yes there was really only two but I look 57 so you might a lot well. older than that but anyway that's a different story <laughs> when, when you were younger there were really only two avenues for pornography it was either text like a playboy or something like that or a show you would go to it was mm-hmm. very limited access and so parents had the ability at all times to know where you were right and but with the advent of this magical little device right here you've brought all of the good of the world to a children's to a child's eyes and all of the evil in the world to a child's eyes without any type of access denial to it and so well, it's already impermissible. It's already illegal mm-hmm. for someone under the age of 18 to access these sites. And I know nobody ever breaks the law. Well, and and I think that, that, that I don't think that this will stop what's going on. It might make it harder. Mm-hmm. Uh, I certainly don't think it. And, and I don't think anyone's claiming that it would universally stop no. a underage children from figuring out a ways to access this. And my concern is that, that you, you this will not stop in terms of government overreach. And here's my concern with it. And I don't disagree with anything you're saying about pornography. And I probably misrepresented my position a little bit yesterday because I was arguing with Cameron Smith about this Mm -hmm. and I was arguing against government overreach. But first, um, I don't know how you catch all of these flies that are going to come around the net uh, because you can catch these big companies Mm -hmm. that are making large amounts of money. Uh, But I know, and we all know that, that there are endless websites, endless URLs, endless ways that they can jump around this. That's a concern. So the reason it's a concern is that when that becomes apparent that we have not caught the flies, government's going to try to catch the Mm -hmm. flies and they're going to continue to work. I think that this is leading. I want to jump to the chase and and I'm not against having this conversation. Age verification for the Internet, Mm -hmm. for the Internet. Mm-hmm. Not for pornogra- pornogra- pornographic websites altogether. I want to know what age you are if you are looking at the Internet. Yes. I mean, I mean that seems like government overreach, but isn't that kind of where we're going? It kind of bumps up against it. Uh, I, and and I'm, not, I'm not arguing with you on your position. No, no, no. I'm, I'm not um, arguing with you. It, yes, you bring up a valid point, and I think that's where we have to be very cautious where we go with this. Um, your fly analogy, right? If you know anything about a barnyard, you don't have to catch one fly. You just got to follow the fly. It'll lead you to the source. And there'll be other flies there. And so with Homeland Security here, with the technology we have, we can let one fly lead us to the problem, and then we can figure out where the problem is and solve it. That's what I think we're trying to do here is create the the, the necessary um, eyes to look at the problem and figure out where it is and then come back to us and say, hey, here's how we fix this. Yeah, and the, the other question is obviously who, who decides what is and what is not pornography. That's the Miller test, sir. That was that was set forth by the Supreme Court. And Wasn't that, I, I know it when I see it? That's, 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 the, that's the answer. Because it's... It's the community standard right, test. it's the community standard test because in different communities, pornography is going to mean different things to different people. And so you got to have that. Yeah, but y'all got to write that down. I mean, because, I mean, are, is a naked woman pornography? Depends on the situation. That's why if you read the Miller test, it talks about the period nature. Well, that's what I'm saying, though. But we have to figure out what our community standard as a state's going to be before we move forward to this. Is this happening this year, you think? Or is it, it do you think it'll get kicked to next session? It's already passed. According to what I'm looking right here, it's already passed the House. Has it passed the Senate, though? I, I, think, I think it's up for a vote. Well, we'll see. Uh, all right. Uh, 
Some questions for Sapicki after the break? Can we get off of pornography for a while? Yeah, yeah, we will. No, we're going to have questions for well, unless the people want to ask about pornography. And then there's one announcement I want to make for you. All right, well, we'll take a quick time out. I've got questions for Sapicki. A lot of you have lined up your questions, concerns, comments. We'll do that next. It's Scott Sapicki on Super Talk 997 WTN. Giggity. Super Talk 99.7 WTN. I've had my turn. It's now your turn to ask uh, questions for Sapicki. It is our funny and fun name for uh, your questions on the Members Nutrition Super Text Line of Scott Sapicki. And so I'm going to uh, I'm going to rattle some of these off for you, Scott, and find out um, and find out where you are on it. And I have to uh, I have to work through a lot of the conversations that are going on exterior uh, to um, our uh, certain conversation. Hey, Matt, how is this? Bill going to work with PlayStation and Xbox devices. Um, my kids are all adults now, but when they were younger, they had parental settings on our phones and computers. Um, it, that, so, so you you have to define the parameters of what constitutes pornographic website, and then once that's defined, this, the AG is going to be in charge of hmm. enforcing and create. And, and and I'm sure there's state agencies that'll create the dynamic that. I mean, Texas did this, yes. I think. So, uh, Louisiana, so, I believe, has done it. So Homeland Security, Tennessee, by the way, Homeland Security, not the federal, but Tennessee Homeland Security will work with the AG's office to promulgate the process on how they're going to identify this and, and identify there are those sites out there that are going to come to the top of the list very quickly of who they're going to be looking for. And then they will see and look at the other stuff like PlayStation and, and the other one that this, the caller said. But this is just kind of trying to set the groundwork of how this is going to work. So, like I said, it would not surprise me that uh, if this bill passes that we come back next year with a tweak to it from Homeland Security or the AG's office. Uh, question for Scott Sapigi from 3314. Uh, what about cross-county enrollment for, he's, I'm just reading, vouchers. Mm -hmm. um, I think you'll take exception with that word. But uh, as a Williams County resident, I'm concerned about an influx of out-of-county students, mm -hmm. which would potentially be, an unbearable burden for our county. And I think I think what he's talking about is in the Senate's version, there's a proposal for public to public transfers also. We already and it gives some members in the General Assembly and the House side some some indigestion about that because of the potential their cost for your local districts to get a student from outside the district. What we're trying to do is and I'm I'm not I don't want to I don't want to get into the details on this because we're negotiating, but we understand the concern of that caller. We are trying to come up with a compromise that will mitigate his concerns so that we can still have the out-of-district out of district transfers, but they have to go through some type of approval process by the receiving district mm -hmm. to make sure there's not a cost burden to that district. Um, 0857 uh, writes in and says, I think letting teachers be able to carry firearms in schools turns what were once soft targets into more fortified entry and will make school shooters think twice before attacking your thoughts. Well, I think one of the things that we have to do as soon as this bill passes is to change on the outside that uh, we have people inside the building that are there to protect our students. So you send a clear message to those individuals, and we know with the covenant, well, we've heard from the covenant shooter that, you know, she was casing the school trying to figure out, you know, when to attack, the soft mm -hmm. target. And I think once we once we send a message out there that you'll be met with people there uh, to to stop you from gaining interest to the school, I think people will start to change their minds on these soft targets. I agree. Um, Fifty nine sixty nine writes in to Representative Scott Sapicki on the Murphy Show and says, "I promise, if a teacher gets the requirement for having a gun and training, they'll be working for a security company before you know it. Twenty plus dollars an hour is better than any teacher salary." Well, as we all know, teachers, <laughs> there's every teacher. I disagree with that, by the way. Every teacher in the state's going to nod their head right now. They don't do it for the money. They do it because they're called to, to do this, to be a teacher. If we can provide them the opportunity to provide another layer of protection for their students, I think teachers will jump at this opportunity because, one, they get to go through the training to become an expert or as close to an expert as they can. And then, number two, they're able to, to protect their children that they love. So I don't think they're going anywhere. I think they're going to, you know what? You might get more retired law enforcement to maybe want to become teachers. Maybe so. Maybe so. I know you don't want this in your life anymore, but I, I can't help what the people are asking it's about, fine. so picky. Go ahead. Um, what are the punishment uh, aspects to some of this if 
Scott knows. And and I and by the way, Scott has not purported to be uh, an expert on this bill, but he's a member of the House of Representatives. So, and we have you here. Uh, do you know what the punishment aspects of this on the on the, the porn bill, the age verification bill? Yeah. Yes, it says the legislation would create a Class C felony and fines up to ten thousand dollars against website owners and operators convicted of violating the law. Um, Renee writes in and says, "My." Daughter's elementary school in Clarksville has an SRO from the Montgomery County Sheriff's Department every day. Mm -hmm. He's nice. All the kids like him. Mm -hmm. We feel safer knowing he's there when she starts kindergarten this year. How is this bill going to work in the school systems? Uh, oh, wait. So uh, the first question, she she's actually asked two unrelated. So on that front, if these teachers would be in addition to the already existing SRO. So it's an additional resource in these school systems that have SROs. And that's correct. And then in the bill, it talks about how they have to coordinate with the SRO and the sheriff to make sure that they know who is friend, who is foe. Um, and then she asked a question that I, I don't know if she's being funny or not. She said, how does this, uh, I think it's the uh, age verification bill. That's what we're going to call it, age verification bill. How does that work within the school systems? I mean, I would think that you wouldn't want any of that being filtered through the school system sure to begin with, I regardless would. of whose age might be, or what the age might be of the person uh, I using mean, it. I mean, if you're a parent out there and your and your school system allows these porn sites, I think as a parent, just give me a call. I'll make a phone call for yeah, you. Yeah, raise your hand uh, because we aren't, need to we need to know about aren't that. Aren't those systems set up where there's limitations on yeah, the access? I mean, yeah, they flag. There, okay. there is, but, but I, I think what she's getting at is there's a state website that schools access, and it's, I'm forgetting the name right now. Somebody will probably text in what the name is, but it allows schools to partner with the Secretary of State's office to gain access to the state library. And there's stuff on the state library. It's a state library, so there's all kinds of stuff on there. Jason writes in and says, what I have heard is that the punishment side of the bill was Scott's going to personally come to your house and give you a whoop. <laughs> if need be, I would. <laughs> or at least a stern talking to I just I just threw that one out there just to get a look on your face. It was it was perfectly worth it. Uh, Eddie's in Columbia with a question for Representative Scott Sapicki in the few moments we have left. Hey, Eddie. Hey, how you doing, Matt? Doing well, hey, Eddie. Uh, good. Uh, Representative Sapicki, you talked uh, uh, a while ago about saying you wanted to put labels on these vegetables that you're talking about adding the vax to. Mm -hmm. How about we just ban that? Because you're talking about putting the vax in that has caused so many problems and uh, somebody doesn't notice that it's got that label on it. They've already had the vax or a couple of boosters. Mm -hmm. What's that going to do to their bodies? That's a great question. And one of the things we tried to do last year was ban that. We ran afoul of the federal commerce clause. So what we did is we changed the bill to say, okay, if it's going to be in there, you have to treat it as a pharmaceutical, which means it can't be sitting next to normal lettuce because you have to get a prescription for it now. So now it's going to be doled out through a pharmacy, which there you take the profitability away from it. So it would not be in regular grocery stores? No, then. sir, it would not. Well, if, if the pharmacy wants to carry it, they can, but you got to get a prescription for it. Okay, yeah, because I'm thinking... So if there's, an, inf if there's an infusion of vaccine in food products, it becomes a pharmaceutical. a pharmaceutical. Yes, sir. And therefore, the Tennessee Food and Drug Administration comes in on testing and verification, et cetera, like that. Okay, thank you. I appreciate you your got answer. It. Thank you. Thanks for the call. Uh, thank you very much, Eddie. Let's uh, get to one or two more. James is in Nashville. Hey, James. Hi, ma'am. You there? Yeah, I'm here. What's on your mind? You have a question for Scott? Do, do we do we take off the breasts at the Schirmerhorn because that's inappropriate as well? Do we how how where does this regulation end? I mean, I'm right down from yeah. Music Row. I I drive by. I, I drive I by Music every, every day. I, I see yeah. I see debauchery and all of that, but we want to regulate people's rights on the internet. And I mean, come on, man! I see small children subjected to all kinds of pornography on a daily basis. And yet we, we, we take field trips down to the Shermerhorn. Well, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Scott speak to this in a second, but here's here's what I would uh, say, James. I, I'm, I'm just saying, man. I I'm pre I'm predisposed to agree with your side of the argument. Uh, but I don't think you're making the best of arguments. 
because I would suggest to you that I think we all know what we're talking about when we talk about Internet pornography and the difference between Internet pornography and Musica or the Schmimmerhorn that I can never pronounce or whatnot. So Skirmerhorn, horn, by the way. It's Skirmerhorn, by the way. Skirmerhorn? It's Skirmerhorn. Okay. Well, there you uh, go, so piggy. So basically what we do is we look at, and this is, I'm reading directly from the bill, content, content that the average person applying contemporary community standards and taking the material with respect to minors of any age would find sexually explicit and harmful, harmful or inappropriate for minors or designed to appeal to the prurient interest or, con, or content that exploits is devoted to or principally consists of an actual simulated or animated display or, dis, or depiction of specific parts of a body or acts as described in the bill. So basically it's the Miller test. I would, I don't know that I'm, I'm in favor of any of it. I need to absorb it, think about it fully. But right now, I'm me, I'm more predisposed to jump to the chase and require age verification for the internet. Mm -hmm. That would uh, automatically, on the system that you're working on, flag any inappropriate material from getting to the user. Right? So if we just do it as a blanket, you know, so I know that I'm dealing with someone under the age of 18, well, I'm going to block anything that they could receive that would be inappropriate or impermissible mm -hmm. and just blanket it in that way. And I, I would almost be more willing to accept that. I would but, think what you'll see in about six months through government operations, these rules on how to implement this law when it passes will, will become forward and then we'll have a better idea of how we're going to attack this fly you keep talking about. And uh, and a final thought on, um, I, I want to circle back before we go on the, on the scholarship piece uh, because there's, the, the questions about transferring from school. To, I mean, you can transfer right now from county to county. That's, uh, that uh, is permissible. It is, yes. But the, but the districts are allowed to hold a certain amount of spaces for growth, and then they, they can approve those individuals that come into their district. So you're trying, to, uh, you're trying to better incorporate that into this piece of legislation? Yeah, I think we already can use the existing program, and then some local districts, some districts will charge an out-of-district fee, that those U.S. citizens can use the scholarship to use the scholarship to help pay for that. And you mentioned U.S. citizens, um, Plyer v. Dell. Yeah. So I mean, you can't just we can't as a state because of a Supreme Court decision in the 1980s. For those that don't know, we can't just say no illegal aliens can as, in public can, education in public education. But what, if we create a benefit, we can. And so this is a scholarship. It's a scholarship. Therefore, it's a benefit outside the normal funding mechanism of public schools. So this would only apply to u.s citizens in the house version that's correct okay that's good news uh, and i got one thing before we go all right yeah let's let's um, i just want to say that uh, we passed a resolution today on the house floor uh to recognize the relationship between tennessee and israel in support of israel uh we've uh, we passed that we worked very hard uh, chairman todd uh, carried the carried the resolution i was second on it and senator hensley carried it that the long-standing relationship that we have had with the people of israel and the state of israel we wanted to reaffirm our support of them in regards to what happened uh, with the atrocities. So. And I was proud to be a citizen of the state of Tennessee to watch it yeah. uh, because I'm, I'm proud of you guys for doing it. And um, and we will not we will not necessarily address some of the negativity that came out of that. I'm sure. sad to say that there were some that got their feelings hurt and panties in the water or whatever. From a representative that we sit in her district. A, a particular representative in, in question, but... One way or the other, it was passed, and thank you guys for doing it. My pleasure.